welcome back. You've just tuned in to Women's AM. This morning, I am joined by Sister Nusrat, Sister Hannah, and our special guest, Sister Halima. Well, welcome back, sisters. Sister Halima, I am going to come to you and ask, mashallah, CEO of Quran Rehab. What is the Quran Rehab? Well, Quran Rehab is something that I launched about a year ago, and it fundamentally is aimed at revolutionizing our personal um, relationship with the Quran and revolutionizing our culture with the Quran. Um, so, basically, you know, we, how we all really want to adhere to the Quran and implement it for our own benefit. Um, but in order to actually act on something, we need to love it. And in order to love it, we need to know it. So, these are the fundamental aspects of what Quran Rehab is about. So, through coaching and personal development workshops and things like that, it's about trying to facilitate uh, a loving relationship with the Quran and emotional connection with mashallah, it. MashaAllah, I can see why you've called it rehab now, because I think a lot of us have kind of lost touch with the Qur'an, which mashallah is going to link very nicely into our topic today. So let's get cracking and go to her views, where we discuss how to establish a productive relationship with the Qur'an. Life can be an express train, taking you from place to place and from moment to moment in hyperspeed, and this can leave you feeling overwhelmed and lacking in having any real connections. This can be especially true when it comes to our connection and productivity with the Qur'an. How do we establish a productive relationship with the Qur'an? This is a live discussion, so if any of you viewers would like to have an input in this discussion, please do call in. The number is on your screen now, or you can tweet us at Islam Channel, hashtag WAM15. So, Hannah, I'm going to come to you first. How can the life, the life that we live have uh, an impact in the relationship that we have with the Qur'an? Um, I think that's a really interesting question, Ayan, particularly because of the way that you've worded it, in that you're asking how does the life that you live impact the relationship with the Qur'an first, whereas most people first of all do it the other way around. Um, and I think that's important because it's taking into account our reality, which inevitably affects us. And we're living in a society that is incredibly detached from any kind of continuous or uniform religious guidance. And instead, you know, there's a huge emphasis on individual freedom and, you know, doing what you see fit to be right. whereas as a, from an Islamic point of view, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the Qur'an for, as our guidance and to determine what we see as right and wrong. And I think that when approaching then the Qur'an, looking at it as that book, as a reference point for everything that we need, not just as and when and picking and choosing the parts where it's necessary, it's important to, you know, make sure that we're in at that atmosphere in the first place. It's a good point that you make that we say that the Qur'an is a reference point to how we live. A lot of the times we kind of lose the meaning or the importance of the meaning in that. I mean, are we actually, we're actualizing that statement that Qur'an is the reference point, Sister Halima? Well, I think that's a really interesting question. It's actually a question I ask myself on a daily basis. Um, I think it's a type of question we can only ask ourselves on an individual basis um, in order to really make an impact. And I think with regards to um, this, this question, I think there's actually a prerequisite to this question. So before we ask ourselves, are we able to um, adhere to the Qur'an and use it as, as the main source, as our, as our reference point, I think we have to actually ask ourselves, in order to do so, do we actually know what the Qur'an is? Are we actually introduced to the, the authentic version of what the Qur'an is and what it's about? So what do I mean exactly? So for example, um, a lot of sisters might say, what are you talking about, Halima? Um, I know that the Qur'an is um, the word of Allah, a miracle from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's his word. We know it's an ultimate guidance. But I would ask, do we really like subhanAllah if we look at the stories in the Quran for example about the prophets and we read their amazing uh, miracles so we read about Isa salam being able to bring back the dead to life we read about um, you know Musa salam being able to part the sea and we're in absolute awe and amazement at this and we can't we can't fathom how somebody at that time witnessing these kind of miracles um, wouldn't adhere to to such miracles but then I ask sisters well subhanAllah are we do we not view the Quran in the same way Every time we open the Qur'an or we hear the Qur'an, are we not, why, why is it that we don't feel in awe of it? Because Allah SWT tells us that this is actually the, the greatest of all of those miracles. It's more miraculous than the sea parting. It's more miraculous than bringing the dead to life. So SubhanAllah, this is something that I think that to really focus on knowing the Qur'an first uh, is a prerequisite in order for us to act on it and for it to be really a, you know, a reference I mean, that's, point. That's a really good point. It's about how you view it and sometimes it does have an impact, doesn't it, Sister Nusra? I think so and I think partly why we can or may not see the, um, the Quran as being a reference point and how we can have problems actualizing it depends upon the mindset. Ultimately, you can choose to make something a reference point if you choose to do so. But I think one of the things that impacts our ability to do so is, yes, as Sister, um, as, uh, as Sister Hannah actually just said, 
the fact that we've become very detached. We live in a world where, because of the rise of postmodernity and particularly of secularism, religion is being relegated to the private sphere as opposed to being within the sphere of influence or, or, or as you'd like to say, one of many competing orthodoxies for that. We find that um, people see, we find even problems in people actually actualizing the Quran, implementing it. For example, in China, where some people are banned from fasting or observing um, religious um, requirements. And there was one sister I know actually that found it hard to even see it as um, a reference point because she'd lived in an environment, particularly when growing up, that they saw no point of it. So a lot of it is down to our environmental circumstances. But I think in, lieu, in, in the light of our environmental circumstances, if we truly believe something, we can actualize upon that and see the importance of it. So ritual, and as well of the ritualistic thinking we have, we tend to think of it as just a book of rules, not something that has the ability to transform the life of an individual, as I think it helps as well me, for example, transform my life. Absolutely. We kind of have like this 2D vision of the Quran, isn't yeah. it? It, you know, we look at it, yes, yeah. like, yes, this is a book. I read it from time to time. You know, it's got great stories, but then it doesn't have much effect beyond that. And I think, yeah, it is true. Sometimes you kind of lose touch about what the Quran actually is, having that love for it, subhanAllah. But sometimes it can come down to maybe just not having time or sometimes just bad time management. <laughs> Going on to my next question, you know, um, productivity can be an issue for a lot of people. I know that sometimes my productivity levels are just kind of, you know, I go through slumps, but what are these sort of uh, issues that hinder people from being productive in terms of how they utilize their time in, in connecting with the Quran, Sister Halima? Well, I think um, there are uh, several different factors that hinder a person's productivity. From my experience as a personal development coach, I would say there's three main ones, which is number one, not having um, a lot of clarity around exactly what it is we want to achieve with the Quran. So, for example, uh, in a coaching session with a sister, um, I get a lot of generic answers. So people will say, OK, what do I want to achieve with the Quran? I want to be able to memorize it. I want to be able to spend more time with it. What exactly does that mean? So, for example, a lot of people, when we actually, you know, for example, in the coaching process, we actually discover that a sister might actually want specifically, when she says, I want to uh, spend time with the Quran, she actually wants to spend time with teaching her child the Quran. Or when we, when we say, I want to uh, understand Arabic, she actually might want to just be able to pray her prayer and be emotionally touched and cry. So to have this clarity around exactly what we want with the Quran is really, really important. And we do that by asking ourselves strategic questions such as, you know, what is it that would bring me joy? What is it that would bring me spiritual fulfillment in terms of my goals with the Quran? Yes, finally, do you know what? I, I'm one of those people who have those generic answers or generic questions, and I think that's a very good point, something that I'm going to kind of inshallah. look into, inshallah, myself. Sister Nusrat, what are sort of the things that you find are the issues of productivity? I think like it goes back to what you were saying, time management, procrastination. I find that generally there are people that generally do want to be productive with it, but due to lack of time management, they experience difficulties. Um, again, mindset as well. Generally, um, a, son of, a son of Adam, if we see something as important, we would not um, delay it. We'd actually say, look, we have to actually start pondering being productive with it. So again, it comes down to our mindset and attitude. You find that the hectic lifestyle we live in gives us very little time to actually contemplate. And this is something that hinders you from actually not only having a sound heart, but trying to get right with God in that sense because I think there was one um, um, priest that one time said that a heart that's never truly at rest can never truly know God. So those one of the things I think for me stood out. When are we taking this time to contemplate? Why are we not trying to reflect and ponder our existence? Why we're here? Who created us? And where are we going? And those are the things that the Quran actually answers, particularly in society where there's so much confusion as to religion and as to God himself. So, Fran, I think we do, we get really, really wound up, don't we, about the things that are going on around us, and we tend to, to, to lose that focus. I mean, Hannah, mm -hmm. you're a student yourself, and you're always on the go, I'm sure, and you've got to kind of really manage your time very well to get everything done. How have you found yourself, in productivity-wise, what's helped you? Um, I think it's definitely just about making the most of sort of, you know, the time that you feel you don't have but you actually do that sounds a bit funny but for example you know for me it takes me an hour every day to get into uni you know walking to walking again you know listening to quran in that time that's a whole hour dedicated to the quran to the understanding you know you have recordings as well now with the translation even if you you know but although listening to the tilawa itself is just so beautiful and so inspiring so take advantage of what you've got yeah. to hand alhamdulillah we're off to a break now but do stay tuned to get your answer in how to establish a productive relationship with the quran before we go here's another reminder of this week's competition.